My name is Sean Millman. I'm a PhD candidate in percussion performance at NYU, and I appreciate your time. What I'm presenting today is a deliberate practice loop for musicians. My research relies on many people's work, but there are a few key ones I want to mention up front. This is Anders Ericsson. He is a professor of psychology at FSU in Tallahassee, Florida, and known as kind of the father of the science of expertise or the study of expert performance. He did a study in 1993 in Berlin of violin students and how many hours they practiced and how many hours they had banked in their life that led to the popular kind of 10,000 hours to being an, ex an expert rule. That was a misunderstanding of his work, but it came from him. And the, uh, the concept of deliberate practice is largely an Ericsson idea. This is Jason Haheim. He is one of the two principal timpanists of the Metropolitan Opera. Uh, he teaches a course at NYU called Process of Auditions. I have taken it three times. I am now the TA. Uh, Jason was a nanotechnologist in Chicago, uh, working with very, very small computery things. He has, I think, 20 patents to his name, and the thing he's most excited about is that, to his knowledge, he holds the distinction of creating the smallest ever portrait of Homer Simpson. It's like five molecules across or something. He's excited about that. Um, he, uh, while he was a nanotechnologist in Chicago for about 10 years, he was taking timpani auditions as kind of a part-time side thing. And with his background in science, he created his own process. Uh, he didn't go to conservatory or anything like that to help him be able to take lessons better, um, be able to be his own best teacher. And he sort of operationalized these concepts of deliberate practice to create a process that he credits a lot with his win of an audition at the Metropolitan Opera. Uh, he introduced me to a lot of these sources and a lot, I owe a lot of the backgrounds of the concepts of my work to Jason. Okay. <clears throat> my deliberate practice loop is inspired by the OODA loop concept of United States Air Force Colonel John Boyd. This loop was developed for fighter pilots to aid in decision making observe, orient, decide, and act. Observe, look around, see what's going on. If you're in a dogfight, see where the other planes are, how fast am I going, that sort of thing. Orient, figure out how you relate to what's going on, positioning, speed, what are my options. Decide is the easiest one, just pick something to do, and then act, execute, go do it. The loop concept, the reason this isn't just one, two, three, four, although there is a very complicated diagram of this that goes into much more detail that goes across, but the idea behind this being a loop is that once you act, the situation has changed. Or even if you don't act, the situation has changed. This plane that was here is now there. You're in a different orientation to it. There's new information that has to be dealt with somewhat differently. Maybe it's changed a little, maybe it's changed a lot. There's some change. Then you observe these new set of circumstances, orient yourself to the new set of circumstances, come up with your new set of options, make a new best decision, act again over and over and over again until the dogfight is over. The, this loop is used a lot in the business community until you've put your competitor out of business, gained all the market share that you want to gain, increased your market cap, whatever it is. Now, what does all of this have to do with playing music and training people to play music? So my research started as an effort to bring together methods of training college athletes with training college musicians. I did my undergrad and my master's at the University of Florida. And while I was studying percussion, I spent a lot of time watching the Gators win things in a lot of different sports. I was fortunate enough to create personal relationships with a bunch of coaches in different sports and eventually worked part-time for the athletic department. And as I got closer and closer to those um, players and coaches and professionals, I recognized they handled their business a lot differently than we did on the music side. And as I started asking these questions, and paying more and more attention to these differences, I realized um, it wasn't just at Florida that these things were different, that these two fields operate differently. Now, I wanna be clear about something because a lot of people get mad at me about this. Sports and music are different. They're not the same thing. Sports is largely binary. Did the ball go in the basket? Is it a ball or a strike? And music is largely about art and expression. It's much more subjective. There are a thousand rabbit holes to those ideas. I'll talk about those later. That's not what this talk is about. So. As I started doing the research and reading and listening to coaches and business people and Navy SEALs and great practitioners at different things, while reading the scientific discourses on these things and on expert performance, motor learning and sports psychology, it hit me that a lot of these people are talking about the same things with different words and different frames of reference. So Andres Erickson, the first uh, base I put up there in expert performance, and Jason Haheim, the second one, 
talk about things like mental representations. Um, and then I read in the motor learning discourse that there are these entire swaths of research dedicated to determining how best to use visualization or mental rehearsal before uh, performance. And then basketball players are really well known for specific routines they go through before taking foul shots. And then I read in sports psychology about the science behind pre-performance routines. These kinds of same idea, different language connections got me thinking and largely have resulted in this sort of confluence of things that is my research now. I think most people who've been around music schools for any length of time have heard people talk about the inner game of tennis or the inner game of music. Um, and this sort of pop discourse of publications that have helped a lot of musicians but haven't necessarily been based in peer-reviewed research. Uh, I was talking to someone earlier today at lunch who brought up Zen and the Art of Archery. This is another really um, common book that a lot of musicians have found valuable for the mental game of performing. So, uh, I recognized these sort of overlapping concepts, realized that they happen in a specific order, they're linked to each other, they can be repeated, hence the concept of a loop. This is my deliberate practice loop. It goes uh, motivation, mental conceptualization, I'm using the word conceptualization now because um, I've learned that the phrase mental representations has very specific context in cognitive psychology, that's not how I'm using it. Uh, Pre-performance routines, feedback, and target behaviors. <clears throat> Motivation seems like it's the simplest, and it largely is. Do you actually want to do this thing, fly that fighter plane, play this oboe line, play this basketball game, whatever it is? Do you want to do this? Mental representations or mental conceptualization is the performer's mental picture of what an ideal performance looks like, sounds like, smells like, feels like. What does, so I'm a percussionist, right? If I walk on stage and play a marimba solo, what is my mental picture of what I look like playing this marimba solo the best that it can possibly be? Pre-performance routines, again, are like basketball players before free throws. Uh, what does the performer do in the last few moments before executing the performance? Then the rep or the repetition happens, either in practice or in performance. This can be as small as, you know, I'm a drummer, as one stroke on a drum, or as big as an entire recital or an entire concert series. Then, so the, the, the rep, the performance comes right here. Then feedback comes from three sources, self, peer and coach, I'll talk about that a little bit in a minute. And the last element is target behaviors. Um, this is something, this is the one that I think is the least intuitive, so I'll spend a little bit defining it. These are high impact inflection points that have an outside effect on the outcome of the performance. Something like in basketball, a foul shooter keeping their elbow straight, or in drums, a drum set player hitting a great backbeat rim shot. That element might only be 5% of the total um, performance of the skill, but it might represent something like 30 or 50 percent of whether that skill is successful or not. So in the, in the drum example, uh, if you have the greatest drum groove ever written of all time and it is played perfectly except every snare drum note, the, uh, the drummer misses that shot and all you hear is that instead of that like great fat rock and roll snare drum sound, the groove sounds bad and no one wants to dance or listen to it at all, even if the entire rest of it is played really, really well. These are the ideas of target behaviors and inflection points, small things that have a massive impact. So, a little deeper into each element. The rest of the motivation piece, beyond do you want to do this, comes from what's called the optimal theory of motor learning. This is proposed by Gabby Wolf and Rebecca Luthwaite, who kind of looked at all these various threads of the motor learning discourse and tried to unify them to a single understandable theory. They claimed that the motivational factors of motor learning uh, how we train our bodies to do a physical thing, how we kind of get muscle memory, as loaded as that term is, uh, boil down to autonomy and expectations. That if we believe we have some autonomy or choice in our learning, and if we believe that because of that autonomy or choice and because of uh, our decisions in doing that, that we have control over the outcome <coughs> of what's going to happen and that something good is going to happen because we're in control. So mental representations shows up in expert performance, motor learning, and sports psychology. The key study that I'm using in my work is the PETLEP model of motor imagery. This comes from uh, Paul Holmes and David Collins. Collins excuse me. And it's a science-backed way of remembering which Collins concepts need to be accounted for to use visualization in its most effective way. It's a concept that's been around for about 20 years and has been studied and shown to improve performance versus non-PETLEP imagery and versus um, control groups who aren't using imagery at all. So PETLEP is, again, physical, environment, task, timing, learning, emotion, and perspective. So physical, 
what does my body do in an ideal performance? Environment, what does the concert hall sound like? What does it look like? What's the temperature? How many people are in the audience? Is it, am I playing at Carnegie Hall and they're wearing tuxes? Am I playing at a college senior recital and they're wearing gym shorts and t-shirts? Um, <clears throat> task, what am I doing? What's the goal? Timing, how fast does it happen? This one obviously has particular relevance for musicians. Learning, as my perception changes and I get better at something and my understanding of what perfection is, my picture of what that perfection is grows and changes along with my skill. And perspective, am I visualizing through my own eyes what it looks like from my perspective as I, for example, play this movie solo, or am I visualizing from third person, from out there or behind me, kind of an out of body experience? Uh, Pre-performance routines. <clears throat> This element is uh, primarily coming from sports psychology. I think uh, a lot of musicians are familiar with the work of Don Green, uh, maybe Noah Kageyama, who's kind of Green's protege. Green was a Green Beret in the United States Army and then a sports psychologist for Olympians and other elite athletes. And then he realized that those same concepts can help performing musicians. Um, he applied them, uh, he's worked at Juilliard, New World Symphony, lots of individuals. He's had a ton of audition wins with his um, students. The real key thing that Green talks about is what he calls centering. It's a pattern of three breaths designed to be done right before performance. Uh, they're designed for high divers, gymnasts, golfers, musicians, and to get that performer in the best possible headspace to play the best they can. The first breath of this centering process is just about the breath itself. The second is about your body center of gravity, and the third is about a process cue or a cue word. Uh, Green's book, Audition Success, details the process of helping a brass player and singer create process cues for their audition excerpts. The really, really short, in a nutshell version of that is that these process cues need to be general statements of the ideal rather than a technique-related reminder. So, for example, if I'm playing the famous Zylophone excerpt from Appalachian Spring, my cue word might be strong or solid instead of play perfect fourths. That, that excerpt is entirely in perfect fourths between the two hands. I think it's the hardest one in the Zylophone repertoire. But if I'm focused on playing perfect fourths, then I'm not focused on sound and the larger concept of what I'm trying to do with this thing. So the idea is a broader, more general statement of the ideal instead of a technical reminder. The goal here is to eliminate analysis during performance and get us ready to just let the thing fly and do that in a way that it soars, that it's really the best possible performance that we can give. Now we get to feedback in the three sources. <clears throat> So we had our performance or our practice session, roughly in this area, and now we analyze. Those are two separate things. Feedback comes from three sources, self, peer, and coach. Self-feedback comes from using self-recording, right? In 2019, it's super easy. Everybody's got a cell phone in their pocket. At some point, the quality of that audio is not going to be great, but um, for most people, even that is enough to get an awful high percentage of the feedback that we need. Um, so using self-recording, watching, listening back, and analyzing what we heard. Was I in time? Was I in tune? Was that the best tone I have? Was that how I wanted to phrase that correct style? How were my articulations? All that sort of thing. Things that a performer with sufficient knowledge can diagnose and determine and analyze for themselves. Peer is feedback from someone at our level. Maybe a fellow student, I'm practicing, I walk, I see my buddy, like, get in here and listen to me play this thing. Or more commonly, it's mock auditions. And then coach feedback is from lessons with teachers. <coughs> As we get older and move from the beginning stage into becoming more experienced players and into professionals, more of our feedback comes from self because we can use self-recording and get an awful lot of feedback from the practice room, and less comes from peer and coach because that's harder to get. Beginners, it's largely all coach. It's largely all you know going into your lesson and your teacher telling you was that good or was that bad. And then as we progress through our careers, coach feedback also becomes more valuable because it, again, is rarer and also more expensive. Going to music school is expensive, and then once you finish music school, the kinds of people you're taking lessons with don't charge $25 an hour anymore. <laughs> and then finally, target behaviors. Once it's defined, this I think is the simplest thing to talk about at service level. Uh, gets much more interesting when you make it domain specific. Again, this is about those kind of 5% uh, high impact um, inflection points. <coughs> Really the only two things going on here are determining what those inflection points are and then how to focus on them, how to improve them. So, for example, let's take maybe the most important symphony excerpt ever written. This is the coda 
to the first movement of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, um, along with Mozart 39 and Tchaikovsky's Fourth Symphony. This is probably the most important symphony excerpt in, in the repertoire. At letter S, we have eight bars of eight thirty-second notes and an eighth note, uh, four bars and then they repeat. <coughs> These are theoretically very simple. I could take a high school percussionist who's never played timpani in their life and get them playing this at roughly correctly in about five minutes, not even. It's, it's that speed, right? I bet those of us in the room who've never played percussion could play that fast. It's not technically difficult, but it's notoriously difficult for clarity and evenness. If these are rock solid, the timpani sounds good. If they're not, the timpani sounds bad. In this way, it's binary. Making it rock solid, though, is very, very difficult. So, playing these eight bars evenly is a target behavior. Great, we figured that out, that's the easy part. <clears throat> so, I'll close with an example of how this loop works. Let's say that I'm taking a timpani audition. I'm not, but let's say that I am. I have a friend who's taking the New World audition this weekend. Uh, but, for our purposes, let's say it's me. And I'm working on this excerpt because I know basically for sure that it's going to be asked. It's that important of an excerpt, and I have that knowledge. Motivation. I want to practice it because I know they're going to ask it, and I want this job, and I know I need to play this well in order to get this job. Great. That's the sort of do you want to do this level of motivation. Mental representations. Here, I'll go back to the loop. Mental representations. I have a picture in my mind's eyes and ears of what that excerpt sounds like when it's played perfectly and what I look like when I play it perfectly, the way that I want to shape it, including perfectly even 30 second notes at letter S. <clears throat> Your performance routine, before I play this excerpt in practice or in performance or in a lesson, I think about that ideal picture and say a keyword in my mind for our purposes for this example, we'll say that keyword is even. Then I play. Say I'm in the practice room, after I play, I hit pause or stop on my phone, my video recorder, I watch and listen back. This is self-feedback. This is me analyzing my, for myself. And then let's say that I hear those 30-second notes aren't even, maybe I've worked on it for a while, and they're even in terms of time, but they're not even in terms of tone or dynamic. So then I go to my next lesson, and I tell my teacher, hey, it seems like the 30-second notes at S are in time, but they're not even in terms of tone. Do you hear that too? And then my teacher says, yes, I hear that too. And let's say, for example, my teacher diagnoses that and says, the reason why is because my left hand creeps up, that changes the stick angle, my right hand stick is hitting one way, my left hand stick is hitting another way, there's my tone difference, there's my problem. That was coach feedback, that was diagnosis of a problem that in this example, maybe I couldn't figure it out, that's the point of the lesson. <clears throat> but now, now that my teacher's diagnosed this problem, he's given me a new, uh, target behavior that was uh, smaller and more detailed than the one I had before. It used to be play the 30 second notes at S evenly. Now my new target behavior is play the 30 second notes at S evenly via keeping my hand position correct or keeping them even. And now I have more knowledge about what causes something good to happen and I know what I need to do to make that happen. I have autonomy and control <coughs> And the belief that if I do this thing better with my left hand, my performance will improve. That's the motivation factor. We're coming back around the loop. My mental perception or my mental conceptualization now has a clearer picture of what my stick angles need to be as I play those 30 second notes at S. My pre-performance picture, as I'm thinking about this mental concept right before I perform, has a clearer picture of that moment because my target behavior is now left hand uh, position at, in the 30 second notes at S, before I perform, I'm thinking specifically about that because I know that's kind of where it's won and lost for me. That's my 5% with a 50% effect. <clears throat> then, after that practice room rep of thinking specifically about that, going into feedback and my self-feedback, first of all, I have a smarter idea of where to put my recorder before I play that rep. I'm going to make sure that I get an angle that shows my hand position correctly. And then afterwards, when I look at it, I don't have to take two or three minutes to figure out, why does that sound so different? I already know. I go at this thing, and I'm looking specifically at that. That's where I look first, because that's my target behavior. And around and around and around this loop I go, practicing, playing mock, playing mock auditions, taking lessons, and performing until that problem is fixed. 
and a new one appears, giving me a new smaller target behavior to drill down closer and closer to the bedrock of a perfect performance that we know doesn't exist, but is still what we aim at. My name is Sean Nolan. I'm a PhD candidate at NYU. I appreciate your time. That is a fantastic question. It's one I intend to deal with as soon as I finish my dissertation. An earlier version of my dissertation was looking at both forms of this, looking at this in terms of the individual and in terms of the group. Like I said, this largely came out of me. So while I was at Florida, I was fortunate enough to watch some like basketball practices, right? I mean, everybody sees games. But when you go see a practice and see how a team actually functions, this was during the Billy Donovan days he's with the Oklahoma City Thunder and the NBA now. When you actually see how a team functions and see what's kind of beneath the hood, I was like, wow, this is, I've never seen any music rehearsal this efficient in my life. And I'm sure there are some out there. I've heard drum corps is really, really, really tight. Um, like, just that focused. But I had never been a part of one. And I started asking these questions. An earlier version of my dissertation was, how can we apply this to the individual and to the group? Because, you know, as you're asking about ensembles, let's say, for example, you're dealing with a symphony uh, a college symphony orchestra would be a, a good example. If um, the oboe player in that symphony orchestra has um, a given process that they use in their individual playing, it will help them if that is a similar process being used in their ensemble playing. And it will also help them if their studio professor and their orchestra conductor are on the same page about what that process is, because then they can use similar language, right? So if, for example, you had a symphony orchestra and an oboe studio that were using similar language, then a conductor might mention to an oboe player, um, I, I don't know, your sound is tinny today, right? I, I, don't, I don't know anything about the oboe, right? But let's <coughs> say that they get that, right? Then the oboe player can go to their um, oboe studio professor and say, I heard my sound was tinny. What can I do about that? And then what can you do about that? I'd probably work on my reads. <laughs> okay, you work on your read. So we have a target behavior of getting good reads. Great, right? And now the, the interaction of these things helps that player get better faster. And even from what little I've observed in the college athletics world, um, there's a lot of that idea of the, um, the confluence of team improvement and individual improvement not being separate things that the individual improves and then goes into the team and then gets better, but that they're the same kind of process. So three to five years down the line, I'll be working very hard on answering that question. <laughs> I'm very interested in that. It's just outside what I'm doing right now. Yes? I have more, I have a kind of a wide question, but the motivation um, is key, and perhaps you say the easiest, some of the easiest aspects of this, but what if your motivation is just simply to have a beautiful performance? Right, so when I say it's the easiest, I mean it's the easiest one to understand, okay. right? As I talk about right. these clues, right? Do I want to do this? Yes, no, the end. Um, I mean, is there room in your circle for mistakes? Sure. I mean, the, the circle assumes mistakes. So, and I was happy to hear you say, you know, we are striving for this perfect um, performance. I'll say, and I, I'm so fascinated by this, that's why I'm asking this, because I've, I've lately been finding myself saying to my students, our goal doesn't have to be a perfect performance. Mm -hmm. what, is, what is our goal? And I think that's a really important thing to consider here, because um, I'm, not, I'm not training orchestral musicians mostly, mm -hmm. who mostly have music education students who are not performance majors. But I think as a teacher teaching teachers, it's a very yeah. important thing to have a circle like this or a plan, but I also think there has to be discussion for what happens when this doesn't work. <laughs> sure. You know? Um, so I, I'd say, I'd answer that a couple of ways. One is, as I say, as I use the word perfect, um, another, I think the word I'm using more in my actual dissertation right now is ideal. Um, by perfect, I don't mean um, you know something that's recorded in a studio in LA and nails the click perfectly and oh let's auto tune that and like takes the life out of it. <coughs> I mean the best it can possibly be, right? And that's different in anything, right? In, in a Broadway pit versus on stage at Carnegie Hall, those are different things, right? What's perfect on Carnegie Hall might get you fired on Broadway in the same way the other way around. Uh, 
I don't mean it never deviates from the click and there are no um, human elements ever. I mean, what is the best version that this player can play at their current level right now? So if, for example, you're teaching that music education major who has known since they were a freshman in high school they wanted to be a band director and likes the clarinet but knows their net, or, the, or the oboe in this example or the bassoon or the percussion or whatever, um, but knows that that's never going to be their breadwinner, um, the application of this isn't necessarily let me get um, target behaviors that help me win a job, but let me get target behaviors that help me play to a level that my process that brought me there helps me explain to future students how to get there. Right? So, so this process then becomes almost a process of process, um, which if we go back to Jason, I know he would love that phrase. Mm -hmm. um, does that answer that part of the question? Yeah, yeah. And then what, what, what was the other part? We were talking a little bit about um, perfect versus well, I guess, you know, I guess the motivate, because for me it comes back to motivation as a teacher. Mm -hmm. That's a conversation I have with my students, as you said, like yeah. a, a variety of abilities. But I, I would, it, I have students who would work really well in this mm -hmm. process, and I have students who absolutely would not, because they're, they, they, they don't learn that way. Yeah. You know, which is it's great. I mean, there's, there has to be. Sure. But I just wondered if you had room in there for that discussion with someone who might be going, who might be teaching through this process. That's all. Right, yeah. so uh, the thing I'd say for me, I mean, I, I'm a PhD candidate in percussion. Um, you know, I was spurred onto this partially by the sports thing, partially mm -hmm. by Jason. Um, I'm not looking to win a job like Jason at the Met. If that came open, if somebody handed it to me and said, Sean, you're the new tip at the Met, I'd be like, great, I'm underqualified, but I'll take it, thanks. I don't know exactly what they make, but I'll take it. Um, but I'm not willing to spend the 10 years required to earn that job, right? Um, so for me, as I go around this, my goals for my playing are get every, get my marimba solo playing, get my standard orchestra playing, my symphony playing, my drum set playing at a level where I can realistically win a college job and be able to teach that to college students, some of whom will be performers and some of whom will be educators. Jason didn't apply, he, his process looks different than this because I hadn't done this when he won his job. Um, wasn't worried about drum set playing, wasn't worried about marimba playing, xylophone, anything else. All he did was he played timpani and he went to his nine to five. Um, so his was more focused on a smaller thing toward getting one specific thing, a timpani job in an orchestra. Mine's broader and therefore I'm not going as deep in each thing. So this idea, or certainly other ideas of how to improve at a thing, can be applied at different things. So for a music educator, I might even say, how can we apply this to the process of standing in front of a group of, for example, oboe students and helping them have a better embouchure or make better reads? It could be applied in different ways to different things. Yeah. This is, yeah, this is a great breakdown. I'm wondering Thank what you. your favorite part is, your least favorite part, and how you make the least favorite or like the part you don't like uh, better. Yeah. Um, so. I'm gonna just like rip from Jason here real quick, Jason Hanheim. Um, the kind of, I would say maybe the favorite and least favorite is this feedback area, especially from self, because um, Jason's fond of saying the recorder does not lie, which is, you know, let's say that um, I play Beethoven 9, right? And um, I've really focused on the, uh, the 30 second notes at S, or here, we'll go back to this in, um, in my last lesson with Jason on, on this, um, he told me time kind of sucked until it got right about there. All this um, stuff up there where there's more space, it was a little rocky, and then when stuff happened a little more, uh, my, my time straightened out. I thought my time was great in that rec, right? Like when I was playing that in the basement at the Met, in the, in the percussion room there, I was like, this feels really in time to me. And then Jason's like, no. That's, that ain't it. That's not fun, right? This, I played really well. No, you don't. That, that is the, the kind of the least favorite part of this, but it's also the part that leads to growth because if we go back to Lou, without that element, without Jason telling me that I'm out of time or without me hearing that I can't tune a perfect fourth to save my life on, um, in Beethoven 9 or in anything else, right? Without me knowing that, I don't know what to target. So then I don't know how to get better. Right? This is, I would say, the most important part because without it, none of the rest of it works. 
My pre-performance routines, I don't know what to think about right before I play. My mental representation, I don't know how to imagine a better version of me playing this thing. My motivation, yeah, sure, playing Beethoven 9 is important, but I don't have that additional control and autonomy of knowing what it is I need to do to do it well. Does that answer the question? Cool. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate it.